blocks. Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, and this is The Daily Briefing. The White House briefing is set to begin shortly, and we'll take you there when it starts. But first, Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live on Capitol Hill. Mike, are they getting any closer to a compromise on immigration? We heard that maybe Senator Jeff Flake said that there's a deal. That's right. It sounds like a small group of senators agree on a possible DACA deal, but they need to present it to the rest of the Senate to see if they have enough votes to pass something. And some senators are expressing concern about getting all this buttoned up by next Friday night, January 19th. There's been a whole lot of optimism here on Capitol Hill since President Trump conducted his meeting with more than 20 lawmakers earlier this week trying to get to the bottom of an immigration agreement. Republicans are emphasizing the need to include proper border security and enforcement in addition to addressing the young people brought to this country illegally by their parents. Republicans are generally open to some sort of legislative move related to the DACA population, but there's a couple of priorities that have to be most important. And we need to make sure we're not incentivizing more illegal activity coming across the border. These are very reasonable things that uh, are, are really we're asking to tie together with any DACA solution. And we're asking for our Democrat colleagues to uh, get more reasonable and start negotiating with us in good faith. Others on the Senate side are rejecting any House proposal and are hopeful they are getting close to a deal. We are working as hard as we can to find an agreement that both sides can live with. The only folks who didn't get the memo were some House Republicans who continue to push hardline immigration bills that are outside the scope of the negotiations. If Speaker Ryan is going to listen to the hard right in the House, and coalesce behind Representative Goodlatte's proposal on DACA, we will have no deal. So, of course, the clock is becoming a factor with the government due to run out of money late night, next Friday night. Some Democrats want immigration as part of that, and some have suggested that perhaps a more realistic timeline for immigration might be the end of the month. Dana? All right. And then what about the drama earlier today about reauthorizing that key component of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act? Well, that's right. President Trump sent out some tweets this morning. It left some lawmakers here on Capitol Hill questioning what his position was on that vote on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, Speaker Paul Ryan was asked if the president understood the bill. Title VII, which we're doing today, is foreign terrorists and foreign soil. He knows that, uh, and he, I think, put out something that clarified that. And his, his administration's position has been really clear from the day one, which is 702 is really important. No surprise, the House Democratic leader took this swipe. This morning, he put out two tweets were so undermining of what we were trying to do uh, on the floor in terms of FISA and the rest. We're like, he doesn't even know what the bills are about. Next up, that bill goes to the Senate, where Senator Rand Paul has threatened a filibuster. Dana. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Sure. And now let's bring in Carl Rowe, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff and a Fox News contributor. Carl, just on the FISA bill, it, it's you and I went through this in the Bush administration. Uh, it passed. Uh, it passed again in the Obama administration, and now this would be a six-year uh, uh, reauthorization. So basically, the concerns from privacy pr uh, proponents have never changed, and yet we still have to have this debate every single time it comes up for a reauthorization. Yeah. Well, we understand why. I mean, it's uh, people, Americans are concerned about their privacy. But let's, let's talk for a second about what 702, Section 702 of the law does. It, what it says is the government can sweep up the electronic communications of bad actors abroad that pass through American networks. So even if a bad guy in, say, Afghanistan is emailing a bad guy in Iran, it may pass through American networks. And certainly if they're communicating with somebody inside the United States, we capture that information. And what 702 allows the government to do is to collect that information and to look at it, which means that if a bad person outside the country is talking to somebody inside the country, they can look at that communication without having to go get a warrant, mm -hmm. because a warrant would require them to have probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed right. and there may not be that so 702 is a very valuable tool to keep America safe proponents wanted to basically require that before you ever looked at any communication that went to or came from an American you had to have that warrant and uh, and, the, and the house made a, 
the House rejected that. Uh, the chairman, mm -hmm. Devin Nunez, as I said, unsevely restrictive, came up with a face saving gesture. But this is a vital tool. Move through the House. The Senate is uh, even more likely to accept it as it is. So we're, we're likely to have this tool around for another and six that one, years. So, and that issue would be put behind us. But the issue that's in front of us that comes up over and over again is immigration and the possibility of Im uh, comprehensive immigration reform. Is it any more likely? Uh, that there could be a deal now than in the past. Are the politics different, better? President Trump said he's willing to take the heat. Uh, will there be a lot of heat, and where will it come from? Yeah, look, there will be uh, a chance for a deal, and the president's meeting this week and his attitude of, I'll, I'll, you know, you, 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 let's go arrive at an agreement, and I'll, I'll fly air cover for you, uh, it, it is very helpful. Now, the Senate is more likely to move for reform before the House, but there will be, as you say, there are opposition, and there's going to be four sort of sources of opposition. Okay. The Congressional Black Caucus, particularly mm -hmm. in the House, is going to be concerned about preserving the diversity lotteries. These are the lotteries that allow 50,000 people to come to the United States each year. Put, they put their name into the pool, and they have 50,000 names get drawn, and they get drawn mm -hmm. from countries that are not part of the traditional immigration to the, to the United States, which means right. a lot of Caribbeans and a lot of African Amer uh, Africans. So, so the, the, the Congressional Black Caucus is concerned about this. Immigration proponents want to keep family unification, this concept of if you get here, you can bring your extended family here. What the president wants to do is squeeze that down so it's maybe your immediate family members, your wife or your child, but not your cousin not your brother-in-law, not mm -hmm. your sister, and so forth. And, and there's going to be some concerns about that. Immigration hawks are not going to like to have any kind of path for the dreamers to be able to ultimately receive citizenship. And as a result, they may oppose it. And then finally, just the resistors. We've got a lot of people who just do not like President Trump, who have a D behind their name and serve mm -hmm. in the United States House. And the idea of a wall, even if Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and Joe Biden all voted for some form of the wall in the past, the resistors are just not going to try and let the president have a victory, no matter how sensible and sane it is. He started out saying, I want a beautiful wall all the way along the border. He's now realized we don't need a, a wall all along the border, right. but we do more need more than the 654 miles we have today. Take a look at this. Um, this is the gang of six. We've cut it down from eight to six, so I guess that's efficient. Um, of these senators, we have Lindsey Graham, Dick Durbin, Michael Bennett, Cory Gardner, Jeff Flake, and Bob Menendez. Jeff Flake said earlier, just within the last hour, that there's a deal. There's a little bit of pushback on that. Do you think that these six could come up with a deal that could pass the muster of all the different groups that you just talked about? Well, I think they could do so in the Senate. The House is a more problematic deal. I see this as a two-step process. The Senate has got to come up with an arrangement, a deal, uh, and, and they've got to be able to get that through the Senate. But I think there's going to be a second round of negotiations with the House because I'm not certain the House, uh, all of these various different groups that are more prevalent and more present in the House and more powerful in the House are going to demand a piece of the, of the, of, of the negotiating pie. Rarely does a measure pass with only one House one chamber arriving at the compromise. Uh, if you want to get it done, you generally have to have to have two sets of compromises: one in the House, one in the Senate. Sometimes a third where they come mm -hmm. together. But but everybody on quickly, this issue, they're going to they're going to. I only, I only have a second. But do you think it's better for them to have a deadline of trying to get this done by next Friday, or should they not try to rush it? Uh, you know, it's always good to have a deadline. It forces action. On the other hand, this is a big, complex matter, and I don't think they're going to be able necessarily to get it done. If they can, God bless them for doing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, my sense is they'll get it through the Senate, but not but through the House by, by next Friday. All right. Carl Rove, thanks so much. Thanks, Amy. In Southern California, the search continues for survivors with eight people still missing in those deadly mudslides. At least 17 people were killed when a deluge of mud and debris destroyed homes in the wealthy coastal town of Montecito. And that's where we find William Lajeunesse. Uh, we, you had to be on the phone yesterday because they moved you here. Today we get to see you and you can tell us more about the recovery efforts that are ongoing. Well, I am in one of those several neighborhoods, Dana, that was literally leveled by that mudslide. In fact, there was a house here. It is completely gone. Now, crews were working through the night clearing debris, and as you can see behind me, there are going to be gas companies, electric companies, the National Guard, and seemingly every dump truck in California is here pulling out the thousands of tons of, of dirt that have been brought down in mud off of the uh, 
off that mountainside, bulldozers, backhoes working full time. Now, I was just in a neighborhood where about a dozen homes were swept off the map. I met a man there who was asked to check on a neighbor. She was gone, but the house was literally cut in half. He was clearing gutters on Monday night at 3 a.m. when he heard what sounded like a freight train. A neighbor said he needed help evacuating his family. Here's what he said. It wasn't a huge amount of rain. It was just a lot of rain really quick. Had we not had those fires, I don't think we'd be standing around here. I don't think you guys would be here today. It would have been a quick little one-day story, and there certainly wouldn't be the 101 close. So um, it's been about three and a half days now uh, since the deluge on uh, Monday night, uh, late, late, uh, about 3 a.m. Um, so people still have hope for the eight individuals who are mm. still gone, uh, but they're running out of time. Dana? And William, what do you know about the people saying that they didn't hear about the mudslides until it was too late? Well, you know, the local weatherman said there was going to be rain of biblical proportions, and people laughed at him on Monday night at 11 o'clock when it didn't happen. Then, of course, it came at 3. Now, the county did say to people closer to the burn areas that was a, a mandatory evacuation because that was close to where the, the mud would have come. In fact, the danger part was down here. This was a voluntary evacuation area. Secondly, the county put out about 200,000 emails telling people, you know, this is a bad situation, but they did not use this cell phone alert system, like the uh, Amber Alert. They said they didn't do that because they feared that they told everyone no one would listen. This man wishes they did. They didn't tell us that something bad was going to happen like they knew. Uh, there, there's something there. So, you know, uh, one gallon of water, Dana, I didn't know this, weighs eight pounds. The neighborhood I was just in, I saw 2,500 gallon mm. containers washed away up against trees. So that just tells you that mudslide, the power that mm -hmm. it had and scoured things like this. All Back right. to you. All right. William Lajeunesse, thank you so much. Today's White House briefing is about to get started, and we will take you there when it gets underway. Plus, a big change could be in the works on the chessboard of global alliances as the U.S. cuts aid to Pakistan. Is China now moving closer to Islamabad? General Jack King, he's on deck with his analysis. Such policies and such uh, uh, attitude from the United States will only help or will, and will only increase extremism in Pakistan and in the region and overall in the, in the world context also. alert as the White House briefing is set to start any minute. We will take you there as soon as it begins. But first, the House today passing a bill to reauthorize a controversial section, 702 of the FISA bill, sending it to the Senate. We now bring in Fox News senior strategic analyst, retired four-star general Jack Keane, the chairman of Institute for the Study of War. Before, I want to talk to you about uh, Pakistan in particular, but let me ask you about the 702 program. From your perspective, how important is it and should we have had it before 9-11? Yeah, absolutely. If we had it before 9-11, likely we would have detected what they were doing. We would have had the full authority to monitor, their, to track their phone calls and also to surveil their phone calls. In other words, listen to them. Mm -hmm. We've had it since. It makes all the sense in the world. It absolutely is critical if we're going to give our intelligence agency, and particular, particularly the National Security Agency, the ability to monitor terrorist phone calls. Mm -hmm. Well, it did, it did pass the House, and now it goes to the Senate, and it looks like it will pass there as well. Let me ask you then about um, the United States making this decision to cut aid to Pakistan. Listen to the press secretary from the State Department. The President, Secretary Tillerson, and Secretary Mattis have all had conversations with Pakistani officials, alerting to them to our concerns that Pakistan has not done enough to detain, to take care of, and when I say take care of, I mean uh, round up, uh, terrorist and militant groups operating from within Pakistan. We've had a series of discussions with Pakistan about that, uh, telling Pakistan that they need to take more decisive action. So what does this mean about us cutting off aid, and will Pakistan seek aid someplace else, like from China? Yeah, absolutely. They'll they can compensate and get aid from China easily. China's already going to open a naval port in Pakistan. Sir, General, could I have you just hold on for just a moment? President Trump is just now leading a roundtable discussion on prison reform we at the White House. Let's listen in just for a moment. Vicious cycle through job training, very important job training, mentoring, and drug addiction treatment. And you know how we're focused on 
drugs pouring into our country and drug addiction. It's a big problem, even as we speak of this subject. We'll be very tough on crime, but we will provide a ladder of opportunity for the future. The governors with us today have pioneered reforms. They've been very, very successful, and we appreciate you being here very much. That can inspire change. Kansas improved its juvenile justice system to help make sure young offenders do not become repeat offenders. Kentucky is providing job training to inmates and helping them to obtain professional licenses upon release. And it's been very successful. It's been a great governor, I will tell you that, my friend. My administration is committed to helping former inmates become productive, law-abiding members of society. And I want to thank you all for being with us, and thank you for the discussion. And maybe we'll take a couple of minutes, and, Governor, you might want to say something as to prison reform. You've been very successful. Sure. No, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you truly to those of you in the media for being here and for covering this. It does matter. If there, there, you'll hear a lot from people who know far more about this than myself uh, if you stay in here as we go around the horn. But I will say this. If you take nothing else away, than this absolute fact and communicate this to people. The 95 plus percent of everyone who is incarcerated is going to be released. The vast majority, more than 95 percent, will be released. What are we doing as a society, at the federal level, at the state level, at local levels, what are we doing to ensure that they have been rehabilitated and that they can be reassimilated? We're good at removing, but we need to do more than simply remove people from society. Something we're battling with in Kentucky, as are other states. I look to states like Kansas and others. So that was President well. Trump. He's in the Roosevelt Room there, um, hosting a group on prison reform. And we're going to have Senator Mike Lee on later in the program and ask him about that. He is supportive of that effort, and it's actually one that could be bipartisan. But now let me turn back to General Jack Keene. I was asking you about Pakistan and what happened. So we cut off aid, and do they seek aid someplace else, and are we okay with that? Yeah, they'll go to China, and they can make up for it easily. Here's essentially the problem. Pakistan's government, and particularly their military, are providing safe haven to the Afghan Taliban inside of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Not only do they provide them safe haven, Dana, the, the Pakistani military provides them intelligence on the operations that we are conducting in Afghanistan. That means they have blood on their hands in killing Americans, killing Afghans, and their military, as well as their people. This has been outrageous for 16 years. No insurgency has ever been defeated, ever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that had a safe haven outside the combat zone. Two presidents before this one mm -hmm. have never confronted this issue full on. Mm -hmm. This is the first president that's taken it full on. We're going to keep you over, if you don't mind, because you said you didn't have an, a pressing engagement. So if you could just stay with us, because we have to take a quick break. The White House press briefing is set to get underway any minute. We will take you there live when it begins. Plus, oil prices rocketing to a three-year high. What it means for your bottom line. Still ahead. We are back with Fox News senior strategic analyst, retired four-star General Jack Keane. He's the chairman of the Institute for the Study of War. The president's meeting on prison reform just ended, and a question was shouted to him about Iran and what he was going to do with this deadline about recertifying the deal. And he said, you will find out. Do you know what he's going to do? I don't know, but I, I, what I've heard is he's probably not going to kill the deal. Mm -hmm. And because the mood in the Congress is changing and world opinion is changing against Iran, and there's a thought that the Congress will try to fix the deal. He's, he's let them try that for the last three months. They've not, not done anything with it. Right. But he's been told by some congressional leaders that they may be able to fix some of the bad things. What are they talking about? The sunset clauses, which gets Iran to have a nuclear threshold capability in 10 years, and we're three years into that, and a nuclear weapon in 15 years. Right. Fix that, take that out of there, and make where they are right now with very little enrichment, very little centrifuge, just permanent, so they can't get to a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. Also, put in there inspections that need to be done of all of their military facilities and make certain that it's verified. If they can get that done, then we fix the deal. And, and it's be worth doing that as opposed to just trashing it. Right. Interesting. Okay. Well, then we'll, we'll as the president said, we'll find out. But you got the explanation here uh, at the, on the daily briefing. And before I let you go, North Korea, listen to what the president said yesterday about possible talks.
We have certainly problems with North Korea, but a lot of good talks are going on right now. A lot of good energy. I see a lot of good energy. I like it very much what I'm seeing. Your thoughts on the talks, uh, futile or worthwhile? Likely futile, but something we should do. I mean, the North Koreans are buying time with the talks as they always have. They're promoting goodwill. They're trying to drive a wedge between us and South Korea. But if there's an opportunity here and there's something more meaningful going on because they do feel some pressure right. and we, we can begin to negotiate how they would denuclearize and we would have to give something up, obviously, to convince them that we're not involved in regime change, mm -hmm. then it's worth doing. All right. General Jack Keane, thanks so much for staying with us. Yeah. Good talking to you, Dana. All right. As we mentioned, President Trump uh, facing that deadline on Iran sanctions. And as we wait, oil prices set at a three-year high. So what does this mean for your wallet? For that, we welcome Fox Business's Nicole Petalides. Nicole. Hi, Dana. Well, that's right. You're absolutely right. We saw both Brent crude and West Texas hitting these three-year highs. And with that, we're going to watch for gasoline prices, heating oil. Those things will likely go to the upside. But it is all about Iran and President Trump's decision, which you just said we'll find out soon or we'll wait and see. Uh, as we look at the Brent crude topping, $70 a barrel. It hit this highest level since 2014. But as we talk about the demand that we're seeing, there's they're clearing up the excess in the stockpiles. There's falling output in Venezuela. Those sanctions on Iran from two years ago, they lifted those and there were really hopes that they would benefit. Now we're seeing obviously all these anti-government protests and whether he institutes these back or to some extent and whether or not that will cause a disruption in oil. If yes, that would push oil even higher, Dana. So we'll watch for that big picture. Thank Dana? you so much, Nicole Petalides. And I believe now we have Sarah Sanders which is great news for American workers who are going to be keeping more of their hard-earned money as a result of the new tax cut law. And the secretary will get into those details on that and then answer a few of your questions on that topic. Then, as always, I'll be back up here to take questions on other news of the day. Beth, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me first just comment and say uh, I am pleased that I will be leading the economic delegation for the president in Davos. We'll have a very good large group of cabinet members traveling with us, and uh, Sarah will give more information on that later. Uh, I'd like to talk about the withholding tables. So today, the Treasury Department and IRS released new withholding guidance that will implement the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. This new guidance will mean that workers and their families will receive larger paychecks starting in February. This has uh, been a massive uh, project that we've been working on, beginning to implement the tax plan. There's a lot of work left to be done, but we're estimating that 90 percent of the workers are going to see an increase in take-home pay because of the Tax Cuts Act. This historic legislation doubles the standard deduction, simplifies the filing process, lowers the rate for millions of middle-income Americans and their families. Uh, I want to acknowledge the Treasury's Office of Tax Policy and the IRS who worked round the clock to meet our important objective to work with the existing forms and the existing systems. We want to minimize the burden on both employers and hardworking taxpayers in getting this implemented in February. This is just the first step in a three-step process. Next, the IRS will be releasing a new withholding calculator that will be available on irs.gov by the end of February. This will help provide individuals with certainty so that they are neither overwithheld or underwithheld and can plan their financial decisions. We have reviewed this very carefully, and based upon last year's withholding tables, approximately 76 percent of taxpayers were withheld so that they had refunds at the end of the year. We expect, based upon the new tables, there will be no material change in this number. We will encourage taxpayers to use the calculator when it is released and we'll launch a marketing effort to make sure people understand that. Uh, finally, I'd like to say that the Treasury and IRS will work together to release a new W-4 for 2019. We expect to release that later in the year. Uh, we will be meeting with employers, payroll providers to determine how to best to design the form to reflect the new law. And the IRS will continue to focus on simplification and a user-friendly process. These new tables will help 
deliver the tax cuts as soon as possible to as many Americans as possible with as little disruption as possible. This will continue to focus and fuel the optimism and economic growth that is returning to this country. I'd also like to highlight the announcement this morning from Walmart. We want to thank them. Uh, they will be increasing their minimum wages, issuing bonuses, and expanding family benefits for over a million employees. Walmart is the latest company to make such an announcement, directly result of the Tax Cuts Act, and they join uh, over 130 other companies across the nation who have already given such relief. We're now up to over 2 million workers that have seen either special bonuses or additional wages. And uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I have to start with you because you had the hat. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, Make me laugh. Uh, in regards to Walmart and the minimum wage, with, and, and since they've already have the money and are increasing the minimum wage, does that mean that we can expect movement on the federal government's uh, behalf to increase the federal minimum wage forever? Well, I, I think the most important issue is for companies to increase their wages. And Walmart's number is already above the minimum age. This is obviously an issue for the federal government. It's an issue for states. But I'd say the real focus, which is what the Tax Cuts Act has been all about, is putting more money in companies. We've said all along, we believe that 70 percent of this will be returned to workers. Well, do you believe that they should raise the minimum wage, that it should be a federal Next raise? Go ahead. Mr. Secretary, just for those who are watching, on February 1st, will these withholding tables go into effect, and that's when the American taxpayer will first see a change in the withholding of their paycheck? Well, it, it, it'll definitely be in February. Some companies will have it set up for February 1st. Some companies may have the, 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 the next pay cycle. But uh, we are encouraging companies to do this as quickly as possible. We're ahead of schedule in the release of this. And uh, we'd expect that in any event it's in, in February. What is the uh, point of the Trump administration going to a place that is regarded usually as a hangout for globalists? Well, I don't think it's a hangout for globalists. I think the, the idea is the economic team is going to go over and talk about the America first economic strategy. Uh, we're, we're thrilled that the president is coming, and I think what we know is that the economy that's good for the U.S. is good for the rest of the world. You, you, um, you just talked about Walmart, and that's a big deal. Um, what has been the, uh, the efforts with Walmart, with this administration, for them to raise their wages? Well, again, the, the whole purpose of the Tax Cuts Act was to put more money in companies so that they could compete competitively with international companies. I think you know we had one of the highest tax rates in the world. We taxed on worldwide income. We've changed that. I mean, this is really a revolutionary process. Uh, we thought it would be great for the economy, and we're thrilled with already the number of companies that we see reacting but have accordingly. Have talking with Walmart on this? How long have you well, been we, talking? We, we, we've been talking with lots of companies for a long time, and uh, we're thrilled with how people are responding. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Thank Secretary. You. Um, you are using an outdated, or the system will use an outdated W-4 form for this year. You will encourage people to go on to a calculator on the IRS website to maybe try to figure things out. Taxes are messy to begin with. How is this not going to lead to, in one way or another, some sort of implementation mess? Well, you know, I, I give an enormous amount of credit for the team at Treasury and the team at IRS who have literally been working around the clock through the holidays. As you mentioned, we had an existing form. We had existing technology. We had to figure out how to fit this in this format. The fact that we've been able to keep the same percentage of people that get refunds, we wanted to make sure that people weren't overwithheld or underwithheld. So we ran, uh, you know, lots of, of of models to run this. That's phase one. Phase two. As soon as the calculator comes out, the calculator will work with the new tax system child tax credits, $10,000 deduction. So a taxpayer can see, do I have the right number of exemptions that are filed or should I adjust that? And then, as I said, we're going to work on a super user-friendly form that fits the new tax system. We're going to try to do that. I want to make sure we get a lot of feedback uh, as we design that and, and update this. I guess when people hear a three-step implementation process of a massive tax system, 
in no way this was rushed to try to get this out there for, for paychecks and February? I, I, absolutely not. I mean, we update the withholding tables every year. You know, there's more work. But again, our objective is to get people money as quickly as they can. Ninety percent of the people will see changes. Yes, in the back. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. I just want to be clear. Um, it sounds to me like you are saying that the administration's policies are partly responsible for the Walmart wage rise, but that the layoffs are nothing to do with you. Is that, am I understanding that correctly, and is that not inconsistent? Well, what I'm saying is the, the administration's economic policies are a function of what we see growth and investment. Different companies will do different things. Some companies will invest capital. Some companies will return money to workers. Lots of things are going on in the economy, and we appreciate what Walmart's doing. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, last year at Davos, uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping uh, made a speech, and he talked about isolationism uh, not necessarily being a good policy for most countries around the world, and sort of was viewed uh, very much as China making a treaty to the global economy, saying, hey, we're open for business at a time when other countries are turning inward. Is the president going to respond to that uh, line of argument when he goes to Davos? What's he going to say when he's there? Well, I think you've heard a lot of the president's messages. I expect that they'll be consistent. Uh, I expect the president will talk about trade, reciprocal, free, and fair trade. Uh, we've obviously been very clear with the Chinese on the issue that we have with the trade deficit, making sure that U.S. companies can compete fairly. And uh, the president will talk a lot about his economic program and the impact on the global economy. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, staying with trade, can you give us an update on the negotiations over NAFTA? And how concerned is this administration over the fact that Canada has recently made a complaint to the WTO and that Mexico is concerned that this administration will, in short order, withdraw from NAFTA? Uh, we gave the president an update this morning on trade. I think he's very pleased with where things are going. Ambassador Lighthizer is doing an amazing job renegotiating NAFTA, and we expect that will be renegotiated or will pull out. Mr. Secretary. Yes, Mr. Secretary, I know you've had a lot going on with taxes, but since we have you here, could you give us an update on Treasury's progress on this list of Russian oligarchs that Congress had asked for? Uh, I believe we were expecting it sometime in January. Can you let us know where that's at? We're working on it uh, as we speak. It should be released in the near future. And uh, it's something we're, we're very focused on. Yes, Mr. Secretary, uh, if I heard you correctly, you're predicting that there won't be a great increase uh, or uh, it, decrease, rather, in the number of American taxpayers who uh, used to get a refund, who basically the same number will still get a refund that, that have been expecting to get a refund all along. Is that is that correct? That, that, that is correct. Again, what we're trying can you then address the, the Democrats' charge that you all are, are juicing this? Again, I think this is another ridiculous charge. That's why I specifically want to make clear that there won't be a change in that number. We have people who have worked very carefully on this. Our objective is not to have taxpayers overwithheld so that they owe money at the end of the year. As I said, kind of we have a system. Ninety percent of the people will get money kind of the same number of people will get refunds. And we're going to actively encourage and make sure that taxpayers understand how to go onto the calculator once it's up and running. We'll work with payroll providers. We'll work with companies. We'll do education sessions so that taxpayers are properly withheld. Are you expecting uh, any new sanctions on Iran to come from Treasury? Uh, I am expecting new sanctions uh, on Iran. We continue to uh, look at them. We've rolled them out, and I think it's uh, you can expect there will be more sanctions coming. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, leaders in some states, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, are talking about ways to limit uh, the impact of the SALT scale back, such as letting uh, people pay their property taxes in a way that would then be charitably uh, deductible. Uh, is the administration going to try to halt any of those efforts, and how are you responding to that? Well, let me just say again, you know, from the Treasury standpoint and IRS, I, I don't want to speculate on what people will do, but I think it's one of the more ridiculous comments to think that you can take a real estate tax that you're required to make and dress that up as a charitable contribution. I, I hope that the states are more focused on cutting their budgets and giving tax cuts to their people in their states than they are on trying to evade the law. Secretary. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. 
Uh, as the national debt clock approaches 21 trillion, I have a few really quick questions. First of all, is this something that the administration is concerned about? Uh, again, I think we've said under the last administration, the debt has gone from 10 trillion to 20 trillion, and, and of course we're focused on the debt, and that's why we're focused on economic growth. This tax plan was about economic growth that will create more revenues for the economy and more tax receipts okay, for, so then, so for then the government. We, so what can we, we realistically expect the national debt to be by the end of the pre and I hope this is not a hypothetical, but by the end of the president's first term? I, I don't have, have a projection the, for that right now, but thank you. Down, Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You talk about the tax being flatter and 90 percent of the taxpayers benefiting from it. Um, yet, it would seem that under those circumstances, you're going to eliminate a lot of the deductions which so many small businesses and self-employed business people depend on. Uh, is there really a major cut in deductions, and how do you expect that will play with the small business community? Well, I think there have, you know, this is about tax simplification and getting rid of deductions, a lot of the deductions that rich people take. But I will tell you, on small businesses, I mean, one of the best features of the tax plan are, are all the features that go to small and medium-sized businesses and pass-throughs. I mean, there are tremendous incentives whether it's the automatic expensing or whether it's the discount for pass-throughs. I mean, we've heard more good news from small business uh, than even from the Walmarts of the world. Self-employed business. Self-employed, too. too, yes. Mr. President, when you're talking about the... Uh, Mr. Impact, President. I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> he just he, he's he's, he's in the other room. <laughs> 20 news, not yet. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in talking about the impact and the benefit that most American workers will see under the tax cut plan, uh, wouldn't this be a good day for the president to release his tax returns so we can see how he benefits from the tax cut bill? And have you recommended that? Uh, again, I've, I've had this question before when I've been up here. Uh, I'll say the same thing. I'll, I'll give you the same answer I gave you last time. I think that there's a ton of financial disclosure that the president has given the American people. They voted for him. He's the president. I think people are happy with that, and the president will decide what he wants to do. Yes. What does the administration hope to achieve with these additional sanctions on Iran? Um, I think the president's been very clear okay, that, uh, that many aspects of the Iran deal need to be changed, that there are many activities outside of the Iran deal, uh, whether it be ballistic missiles, whether it be other issues, that we will continue to sanction that are outside the JCPOA, uh, human rights violations. Uh, we couldn't be more focused. We have, we have as many sanctions on Iran today as we have on any other country. Uh, in, in, in the process, and we'll continue to look at things. Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Just two quick follow-ups to a couple questions that have been asked. Ant's question related to the Democratic charge about the issues that could come up next year. Are you at all just yes or no? Is there any consideration given to the midterms when you guys ensure that the implementation of this would happen in February and not, for example, later to give you more time to sort all this out? I again, let me just explain. The IRS issues tables every January. We knew we were changing the tax bill, so it obviously made sense to wait from January to February so that we gave people time to institute this. Any claims that we're doing this for political issues are ridiculous, okay? I'd also make a comment, uh, you know, the Democrats made a bunch of noise about our numbers uh, and, and, and it, it tax policy. The inspector general just came out with a report that made very clear there was no political interference in this and how we ran these numbers. So uh, I would hope the Democrats are focused on doing things that are good for the economy and the American people. And then to follow up on Davos, too, with Major's question and Amos, yes. you talked about the message being consistent that the president will deliver in Switzerland. Obviously, one of his big messages has been aimed at middle-class Americans. He got elected on this populist platform. I'm hoping you can explain how it's consistent to take members of his cabinet, many of whom are very wealthy to go rub elbows with a bunch of other very wealthy people in Switzerland. Can you explain the consistency of that? I, I can assure you that the members of his cabinet have no interest in going over there and rubbing elbows with anybody. This is about meeting business leaders. This is about meeting our counterparts. This is all about creating jobs, creating economic growth for the U.S. 
as you know, there's, treme there's tremendous investment in, in the U.S. Okay, there's tremendous trade deals going on. I think we've been very clear, and the president has delivered. Look where the stock market is again. The president is delivering for American workers. So this trip is all business. I can assure you it has nothing to do with anything other than that. Mr. Secretary, yes. can you please say, uh, when it comes to charitable giving, uh, people worry that the new tax code with the higher standard deduction could limit giving to charities. Do you share that concern? I don't share that concern at all, and I would say quite the opposite, that we've raised the limits that rich people can give to charity to encourage charitable donations. So I'll take one more question uh, in, in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, will the president decide today on the Iran deal, and do you anticipate that he will waive sanctions like he has done in the past? Uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to make any specific comments on that. It is still under discussion, and I know the president is contemplating his uh, recommendations. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Secretary Mnuchin. Just a quick addition, because I know all of you are wondering uh, about that Walmart announcement. It is uh, based in Arkansas, so just in case anybody clear that up, because I knew you guys were going to ask. In all seriousness, the tax law is already having an incredible impact on American workers and families, and this is only the beginning of what people have to look forward to in the Trump economy. Eight days from now, funding for essential government operations will run out. Unfortunately, Democrats are continuing to refuse to fund our troops and other important national security priorities that keep our people safe. Some Democrats are beginning to realize how irresponsible this is. Just yesterday, Senator Whitehouse said that funding the government should not be tied to immigration, that they should be separate issues. Threatening a government shutdown like that would be, in his words, counterproductive. What's interesting about this is that it's the position most Democrats, including Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, held right up until the moment Donald Trump became president. Democrats should stop making our brave troops and essential government functions, political pawns, and their swamp games. They should stop their obstruction and work with Republicans to fund the government. Looking ahead to tomorrow, the president will receive his annual physical at Walter Reed. Dr. Ronnie Jackson, the president's physician, will conduct the exam. And Dr. Jackson has been a physician to the president for three consecutive administrations. He will release a statement tomorrow after the exam, and then will join me here in the briefing room next Tuesday to give a detailed readout and answer a few questions. And with that update, I will take your questions. Thank you, Sarah. Um, can you walk us through the events in the building this morning that informed the president's tweets about the Pfizer re reauthorization vote on the House today? Uh, they seem to be uh, in, to, took different positions at different times. And as a follow-up to that, would you say, what do you say to the idea that you know, having these seemingly in conflict stances undermines the administration's ability to get an agenda done. Uh, we don't think that there was a conflict at all. Uh, the president fully supports the 702 uh, and was happy to see that it passed the House today, but he does have some overall concern with the FISA program more generally. The president doesn't feel that we should have to choose between protecting American citizens and protecting their civil liberties. He wants to do both, and that's exactly what he's going to do. Uh, we don't see any contradiction or confusion in that. Sir, sir. Roberta. Sir. Um, a quick question about Dr. Jackson's statement. It'll come tomorrow after the the. Yeah, it'd be kind of tricky paper. if it came before. No, but, like, but he'll put <laughs> tomorrow, then, right? Uh, yeah, he'll put out a uh, brief statement, uh, but we'll take the weekend to compile the rest of the results, and lab I'll... results, things like that, and he'll join me here on Tuesday to give a detailed readout of the uh, president's exam and then answer a few questions from Is you guys. Is Walmart, if I might, just because it's in Arkansas? Great state. Um, <laughs> Everybody should go. At, at the same time as it announced the raises, it also announced that 260 Sam's Club stores are going to close without much notice. And I'm wondering if you have any comment on that aspect of, of what's happened today with the company. I don't have any comment on that specific component. We are, again, very excited about uh, the raises and the overall uh, influx of investment that they're putting into their company and helping over a million workers here in the country. Uh, Walmart is the largest employer uh, in the country 
and to see them do and make that kind of effort to over a million workers is a big deal, something we're excited about, and I think further evidence that uh, the tax reform and tax cut packages are having the impact that we had hoped. John. Sarah, if there was no uh, contradiction between the president's tweet this morning and official White House policy, can you tell us why his first tweet sparked off a flurry of activity and phone calls between the White House and, and Capitol Hill? And, I think there's a flurry and, of activity and, at the White House the, every day. And the White House and, and White House staff leading one government official to say we did more work before 8 o'clock this morning than most people do in a week. <laughs> That government official probably doesn't work at the White House because uh, we usually do more work by 8 o'clock in the morning, as most of you know, because you start calling us usually around 5 a.m. Uh, and we try to respond to emails and phone calls about 24 hours a day from you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the flurry of activity. Again, uh, to us, that's a pretty normal day. And we're always engaged with members on the Hill, members of our staff. So that seems pretty uh, standard practice. Major. Two questions. One, uh, Senator Flake has left some on Capitol Hill with the impression that there is a deal on immigration and DACA. Is there one? And does the White House believe it's one it will support? Uh, there has not been a uh, deal reached yet. However, uh, we still think we can get there. And uh, we're very focused on trying to make sure that that happens. The President's been clear about what his priorities are in that process. And we're going to continue working with members of the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, to make sure that we try to get that deal done. Related to that, is the White House familiar with what uh, the contours of Senator Flake is talking about and would it regard it as progress? Uh, I, I can't speak to the specifics of Senator Flake. I can tell you that a deal has not been reached and we've outlined uh, what a deal would need to look like on our end for it to happen. Uh, can you explain from the administration's point of view uh, the value of demonstration projects in the 10 states that have asked for it for those who are able-bodied who receive Medicaid? Because there are critics who say this fun even as a demonstration project, it would fundamentally change Medicaid's orientation to those who receive it because they qualify, and that's historically been the method. If you qualify, you receive Are you referencing the CMS, the yes. new policy? Yes. Yeah, the, they're announcing that to support states uh, in efforts to strengthen the Medicaid program and getting Americans engaged in getting back to work. The policy will allow states to design programs that help beneficiaries improve health and well-being. At the same time, the policy protects the most vulnerable, including those determined to be medically frail or suffering from a substance use disorder. That's what the focus of that program is on. Celia. Thanks, Sarah. Back to FISA, if I can. Many people are interpreting that first tweet from the president. Uh, to me, he didn't actually know how FISA works, and for that matter, that he wasn't familiar with his own administration's policy. That's right. Does he know FISA? Was he familiar with the policy? He, he does, which is why he issued a presidential memo last week uh, expressing concerns and asking for a review of it, which is also why DNI put out a new policy uh, this morning. Uh, this is top of mind for the president, top of mind for the administration, and he has a full understanding. Don't believe me? Ask Speaker Ryan. And look to the comments that he made. He's somebody who's been in constant contact and many discussions with the president on this issue, and he stated that uh, in his press conference earlier today. And how exactly was the Trump campaign so badly surveilled and abused under FISA as he seemed to claim in that tweet? Look, I, I think that there are a lot of things that indicate uh, the surveillance that took place there, and um, I'm not sure what the, the part of confusion is on that front. You guys have reported on it many, many times. Jim? Uh, if you're a dreamer out there, should you have confidence that this president is going to reach an agreement that will protect you from being deported? You should. I think you saw that. Um, you guys got to come into the room uh, in a pretty unprecedented way and sat in there for almost an hour listening to the president talk about it, listening to the president commit uh, to getting a solution on this. Right now, we're counting on Republicans and Democrats to come together, which we think they will, uh, to make a deal on DACA and on border security, uh, which is a vital part of that conversation and something that we insist be part of it. And a quick follow up on, on FISA. Um, there seems to be a pattern, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if, if there is no pattern, where the president watches something on Fox and Friends and then he tweets about it. Apparently this morning, uh, one of their uh, personalities, uh, Andrew Napolitano, uh, said that uh, this is not a good deal, Mr. President, don't do this. And then he went on Twitter and tweeted about the FISA program. Uh, there have been folks out there who have said, you know, there's a cause and effect. He watches something on Fox and Friends. 
uh, and then he tweets about it. Is that what happened this morning, and does that go on? I'm sure you're disappointed he's not watching CNN. Uh, I, I think he watched but, a lot of CNN, if you don't mind me. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that's true. Your numbers would be higher. Um, I, so, uh, in, in reference to uh, the question specifically, no, let's not. Uh, in response to the question, as I just said, the president has a great deal of understanding. This is top of mind. He was talking about it last week. He is issued a presidential memo on it. Uh, so it's not something that just happened this morning. This has been an ongoing discussion and something of great importance. The president doesn't believe that uh, Americans rights or liberties should be abused, but he certainly believes that Americans should be protected. And he wants to make sure we do both of those things, uh, and that's why he supports the 702, but has concern uh, with FISA more generally. Matthew? Thanks, Sarah. Sticking on uh, the FISA topic. Well, at least um, we're consistent. Yeah. If, if you didn't see confusion and contradiction uh, between that first tweet and the White House past stated policy, then why two hours later issue that second tweet that seemed to, to clarify the position. We weren't confused, but some of you guys were. We wanted to make sure you knew the White House position. People on the Hill or, or people in we these several, offices? I had several questions saying. from people in the room. Uh, as I'm sure uh, all of you know, because most of you were the ones sending them, the President's been clear about what his position is. We've issued several statements on this, put out one last night that had to do with this. Uh, look, I, I can't be more clear. I'm speaking on behalf of the President, on behalf of the administration, uh, on what our position is and I think I've laid that out several times here today. Blake? Sarah, on, on Medicaid and what CMS put out today, critics would say you need to be healthy to get a job in the first place. How are they wrong? Uh, look, certainly we want the American workforce to be healthy, and we're focused on helping improve health care across the board, but we also want people to have jobs. We're working on both of those things simultaneously. I don't see how that uh, conflates with one another. Taking advantage of the system? Is that what I'm sorry? Do you think people are just...